Coming up on New Day at Arirang. After two delays, South Korea's first homegrown space rocket, Nuri, successfully launches on Tuesday, sending its satellite payload into orbit. The latest launch now paves way for a new era for South Korea's space program. President Joe Biden announces new rules for the military's use of anti-personnel landmines, reversing a Trump-era policy which allowed the use of the weapon anywhere in the world. However, the new policy excludes the Korean Peninsula, which the White House says is due to the unique situation. Prime Minister Han duk su appealed to the members of the Bureau International Debt Expositions on Tuesday to award the 2030 World Expo to the southern city of Busan. The Prime Minister says Busan hosting the event could allow South Korea to act as a bridge between developed and developing nations. Hello and welcome to New Day at Arirang. It's Wednesday, June 22nd, 8 a.m. here in Seoul, South Korea. I'm Woo Seung. And I'm Yi Seung Jen. Thanks for joining us this morning because over the next hour, we'll be giving you a look at some of the biggest headlines of the days and, of course, experts' insights on key issues facing Korea and the rest of the world. Our top story this morning, South Korea's very first entirely domestically developed space rocket, Nuri, soared into the skies from the Naro Space Center on Tuesday and its satellites have entered orbit. Our very own correspondent Han song woo has been covering the historic launch on site and sends us this report. Mission accomplished. South Korea has become the seventh country in the world to be independently capable of sending a satellite weighing over a ton into orbit using domestic technology. At 4 p.m. on Tuesday, the nation's first homegrown space rocket, Duri, soared into the skies for the second time and didn't disappoint. The three-stage space rocket, after reaching its target altitude of 700 kilometers, placed both its performance verification satellite, holding four functioning mini-cube satellites, and its 1.3-ton dummy satellite into orbit, 70 seconds apart at around 4.15 p.m. As confirmed by the Ministry of Science and ICT and the Korea Aerospace Research Institute's joint presser at the Naro Space Center about an hour after the launch. Nuri reached its target altitude and successfully placed the performance satellite into orbit. Like Minister Lee Jong-woo just said, we have successfully carried out Nuri's second launch. South Korean President Yoon sung yeol wasn't present on site for the event, but watched it from his office in Yongsanggu district and later exclaimed that the way to space had opened, calling the launch a product of 30 years of effort and also promised the country's aerospace officials boosted support. During U.S. President Joe Biden's visit to Seoul last month, President Yoon vowed to strengthen bilateral cooperation on space development, particularly the Artemis program, a U.S.-led international space exploration endeavor that aims to make manned lunar exploration possible by 2025 construct a manned lunar base by 2028, and in the long term, even prepare for missions to Mars. Han seung Arirang News, Gohun. South Korea has taken a meaningful step in its space program by sending its satellites into space using a homegrown launcher. That's right. In the next phase, four more such events within the next five years to improve related technology. PNG has the details. Through the successful launch of South Korea's domestically developed rocket Duri, South Korea took a major step in its space program and boosted the country's growing space ambitions. Now the country will no longer have to rely on launchers from other countries to put its satellites into orbit. 
It may also possibly be able to export this technology to other countries in the future. Now we can help other countries develop satellites and put them into orbit using our launcher. So it's a meaningful step because we are now able to send our satellite into space with our launcher whenever we want. But Tuesday's launch is just the beginning. South Korea plans to send Duri into space for four more times over the next five years. Our government plans to stage four additional launches by 2027 and improve technical reliability and stability. The next launch is slated for 2023, when the country will be sending a small satellite that weighs 100 kilograms into space. Then it'll send several small satellites into space from 2024 to 2027. Also in August this year, South Korea plans to mobilize its lunar orbiter, Tanuri, for the first time. After more than six years spent perfecting its design and trajectory, it'll lift off from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida. It will orbit the moon for about a year, and if successful, it'll be the first South Korean mission to travel beyond Earth's orbit. The country's ultimate goal is to send a lunar landing module to the moon by 2031. Pae Eun-ji, Arirang News. And now it's time for On Point, where we speak to experts to delve deeper into some of the key issues in the spotlight right now. After two delays launching South Korea's first fully domestically developed space rocket, Nuri finally lifted off on Tuesday at the Naro Space Center in Gohong, Jeollanamdo Province. And of course, as you know, successfully placed its satellites into orbit. So a historic launch, and what does it mean for the South Korean space program moving forward, and what comes next? For more on this, we turn to Kang Sung-ju, research officer of the astronomy and space team at the Kwacheon National Science Museum. We just had you on our report, so we turn to you for more details. Well, very good morning to you, Doctor. And well, first of all, um, let's start off with the uh, glitches that Nuri experienced before their second delay last week. What was the issue, and how were the engineers really able to fix the problem in such a short period of time. Okay, the glitch was caused by a level sense of fault in the oxidizer tank in the first stage of Nuri. The problem was that the buoy of the level sensor had to indicate a different value while the launch vehicle was laying down and standing up. But the reading value did not change, which means that you have no idea how much oxidizer was in the tank at the moment. As a result, going ahead with the launch last week was very challenging. When the root of the problem was discovered last week, it didn't appear to be a simple problem to solve. The first and second stage required to be detached and reassembled if the level sensor was a problem. It might take at least two, three to four days to complete the procedure, so it appeared that we won't be able to launch by the backup date of June 23rd. However, the Nuri is completely domestic launch vehicle. Thus, engineers were able to find a workable solution. The engineers were able to fix the problem in such a short length of the time since they were familiar with the internal structure of the Nuri, and Nuri was successfully launched yesterday. Of course, the big thing that we were looking forward to was the satellites, right? And Nuri was indeed able to successfully place those satellites into orbit. Uh, can you walk us through the process and were the satellites able to send the information from orbit as well? Okay. Of course, the Nuri was carried from the assembly building to the launch pad early morning on Monday. Everything appeared to be in order. The launch preparation went off without a hitch, including the problem what we experienced. The weather and the wind speed at the high altitude were both fine. The Nuri took off from the Naro Space Center at exactly 4 p.m. as planned, and first stage was separated at two minutes later. After then, the pairing is eliminated after four minutes, close to four minutes, although the second stage was separated five seconds earlier than we expected. The third engine continued to operate normally since it was inside the airbound. So about 15 minutes after lunch, the performance verification satellite successfully separated, followed by the dummy satellite a minute later. The Antarctic Sejong station got a signal from the performance verification satellite and the Kari data analysis team confirmed that all of the satellites were in stable orbit. As a result, the entire Nuri launch process procedure was a huge success and went off without a hitch. 
But even if we look back just to uh, a couple months ago last year uh, in October, there was a first somewhat unsuccessful launch. So in that very short span of eight months, um, how did the uh, research centre, how did uh, the scientists here in South Korea be able to fix the initial problems to be able to actually successfully launch Nuri? That, in my point, that, in my opinion, I think that was an excellent point. I think I can tell you the couple of reasons why they were able to solve the problem in such a short period of the time. First, as previous, previously I noted, the Nudi was a launch vehicle built solely with the domestic technology. Therefore, problems and solutions were immediately recognized after the uh, first launch. The next point is that there were minimal complications because the first launch in last October was successful more than 90% of the time with only a minor hiccup at the very last part of the launch procedure. If the problem was discovered in the middle of the launch process last time, we may not be able to succeed this time because the problem what we encountered the uh, first launch couldn't be found until the very last part of the launch procedure. So basically, Nuri is our domestic, uh, homegrown uh, space launch vehicle. So that's why we can solve all the problems in such a short period of the time. Certainly, of course, uh, with so much ahead, uh, the space program being more, even more advanced and I'm sure more uh, launches ahead, I think, uh, you certainly you will be busy. A lot of the engineers, scientists, all the rocket scientists here in Korea right. will be very busy as well. Uh, doctor, thank you very much for this. Unfortunately, we are out of time, but I'm sure we'll be able to connect with you again in the near future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Now, in other news, the Biden administration has announced that it will restrict the use of anti-personnel landmines in military combat, reversing a Trump-era policy. However, the White House says that the devices could still be used on the Korean Peninsula as they play an integral part of South Korea's defense. Our Kim yo with more. Washington had decided to ban the use of anti-personnel landmines in its military in conflicts around the world, with the exception of the Korean Peninsula. The White House said in a statement Tuesday that the U.S. is joining the vast majority of countries around the world in limiting the use of the devices that are buried underground or scattered on the surface. It further explained that they have a, quote, disproportionate impact on civilians long after combat has ended. The move follows years of criticism by human rights groups that claim the U.S. has refused to adopt an international treaty banning the use of such deadly explosives. The move is a reversal of Trump-era policy from 2020, which allowed the country's military commanders to use landmines in combat. Currently, the U.S. has a stockpile of 3 million anti-personnel landmines. Under the country's new policy, any that aren't needed to protect South Korea will be destroyed. From Asan, Arirang News. It's now time for Global Insight, where we speak to experts from around the world on issues making headlines. Now, cyber attacks have posed a growing challenge to national security for countries everywhere, with a constant barrage of virtual offensives by actors ranging from states to hackers groups to individuals. Now, this is forcing countries to respond proactively and develop ways to address new unprecedented tactics that are evolving by the day with technology. Now, cybersecurity is one of the issues being highlighted at the World Emerging Security Forum 2022, organized by South Korea's Foreign Ministry this week. And our guest today is Ehud Olmert, former Prime Minister of Israel, who published a new book, Searching for Peace, a Memoir of Israel, this year. And he is currently in Seoul to attend the forum and joins us virtually. Very warm welcome to you, Prime Minister. Thank you so much for making time for us today. I'm delighted. Good morning. Good morning. And well, you're taking part in the World Emerging Security Forum uh, being organized by Seoul's Foreign Ministry this week. And well, first of all, how have you been enjoying your time in Seoul? I'm sorry, say it again. So how have you been enjoying your time in Seoul? Well, very much so. Well, to be honest, this is not my first time in Seoul. I've been here many times uh, before I was Prime Minister in Israel, after I was Prime Minister in Israel, and I always like to come here. 
and particularly at this time of the year, the weather is beautiful. And uh, I enjoyed every minute of it. And also, I think that uh, the, uh, the uh, conference uh, deals with some very interesting and uh, uh, very important subjects, which uh, I hope that uh, Israel has uh, some, some experience that can add to this discussion. Right. So it's been a very highly anticipated summit uh, forum, of course. And, but we, before we get to the uh, forum here in Seoul, I want to talk about uh, back in your country in Israel, the weakened coalition government it said that it plans to dissolve parliament and call new elections. And this has, of course, raised the question of whether certain individuals like former uh, Prime Minister Benjamin uh, Netanyahu will be Maybe. seeking a return to power or uh, whether this will bring about prolonged uncertainty in the Israeli parliament. So I want to know what your outlook is on this. Well, the truth is that uh, we suffer from uh, instability for an um, extended period of time. Uh, it will be sometimes towards the end of this year. and This will be the uh, fifth uh, general election in uh, three years. So it's quite unusual. I mean, historically, it never happened before. And I think what he proved is that uh, there is a um, uh, certain uh, impasse. Uh, the uh, two different political factions there, what is generally called the right wing and what is generally called the left wing, are more or less the same. And uh, therefore, uh, it's uh, very hard uh, to reach a conclusive outcome for these elections. What happened is that the former Prime Minister Netanyahu failed four times in trying to achieve a majority of one that would allow him to form a new coalition. And uh, But at the same time, the last coalition was a very rare political creation, quite unusual. The parties on the right wing and small, some small parties on the left wing, including an, an Arab Isla Islamic radical party uh, that took part in the coalition. Now, one thing uh, I think is of, of great consequence, which I want to share with you, and this is this, that this is the first time in the history of the state of Israel that an Arab party, not just an Arab party, but an extremist Islamic party uh, joined a coalition which uh, comprised mostly of right-wing parties. And this is a revolution, nothing less than a revolution in terms of the dynamics and the uh, interactions of uh, Israeli politics. And it opened the way for the first time for the Arab population of Israel to become a central power in uh, running the state of Israel. So, uh, quite frankly, I don't know what will be the outcome of the elections. I very much hope that uh, Lapid and Bennett and Gantz, the three heads of the present coalition, will prevail and will uh, increase their uh, power and influence and uh, will be able to form a new coalition. But whoever wins these co uh, elections, one fact remains, and this will change Israeli politics forever. And this is the first time that our party was part of the coalition. From now on, the Arabs will play a much greater and influential role in the day-to-day -day politics of the state of Israel. And this is something of great consequence. Well, we will certainly have to see how the situation develops. So, Prime Minister, well, Coming back here to Seoul, uh, the two-day World Emerging Security Forum, it was being held offline for the first time since the pandemic. And, well, how have the last two years really changed the concept of security? And also, how has South Korea's position also changed when it comes to these global discussions? Well, uh, look, on the one hand, and uh, this is, uh, was the thrust of what I tried to share with uh, the participants yesterday, the truth is that nothing fundamentally is new. Uh, pandemics, they took place in the 21st century, in the 20th century, at the beginning of the 20th century, you know, and many, many uh, hundreds of years before. The uh, humanity suffered from pandemics throughout its existence. 
in, in different uh, volumes, but there are always pandemics. And therefore, in this in itself, there is nothing new. And the, the difference, I think, the change which took place is the global aspects of this pandemic. The global aspects is a result of the way we live. You know, in a hundred years ago, we were not flying on a daily basis with thousands of different flights from every corner of the world and people were not moving from one place to the other. Now that they are moving, they are distributing everything, including the possible viruses that can spread the pandemics into places which were immune from it, in a way. So the question is, uh, uh, this is uh, true about pandemics. It's true about almost everything else that we are discussing there. You know, the cyber security and the threat of cyber security, the uh, growing influence of the uh, social networks and the potential uh, influence uh, of fake news, which are spread without, almost without control across the world, because of the uh, the free access to the uh, uh, social networks. So, how can you deal with it? I think that what we have to bear in mind is that, again, uh, talking about cyber, for instance, cyber is a more modern, more sophisticated, uh, more developed very technological system of spying, potentially spying uh, on the, the parties, uh, also on an individual basis and maybe also on a national basis. But uh, countries were spying against each other, you know, for generations and generations. Now they are spying with much more sophisticated um, uh, means, which can be used as, in a very aggressive manner against uh, other countries. So uh, I think that uh, it was said, I don't think that there were proofs, but it was said that, uh, for instance, Russia uh, intervened in the American elections, uh, presidential elections uh, in uh, 2016, and to a large degree manipulated the, uh, the uh, poll stations and the uh, voting results. I don't know if this is true or not, but in principle, I am aware, I know, I know enough, uh, being a former prime minister in Israel and knowing a little bit about the potential of uh, cyber, that uh, with cyber, you can uh, get hold of systems in the other part of the world and uh, influence the uh, activity of these systems. Electro systems, uh, many other different systems that can impact the lives of people. So uh, this is a, a certain war with not with um, uh, artillery or not with missiles, but with uh, impact that can make a difference uh, uh, in the life of uh, nations and in the ability of people in other countries to live their own um, uh, way of life. So there are dangers, and the more that uh, we are uh, developed technologically, the danger are becoming uh, greater and uh, possibly also less uh, controlled or more difficult to be controlled by others. Uh, so what really do we need to be able to cope with it? We need, number one, and this, I think, is uh, the greatest merit of this convention, we need international cooperation. We need a leadership that will have the guts, that will have the, the firmness, that will have the determination to uh, put this on the table of international agenda and to move uh, enough international leaders to define rules for the use of these measures in a way that none will suffer beyond a reasonable and accepted uh, proportion. And, and uh, talking about it and presenting the dangers, the difficulties, the fears, and, and the uh, damages which can be caused on a, uh, mutually, by the way. No, and the one that use it in an aggressive manner can be the uh, target for an attack just as much. 
So it requires a leadership uh, determination by leadership to cooperate. And uh, I must say that I uh, very much congratulate the uh, uh, Korean government and my good friend, the uh, Secretary of State, the Foreign Minister of um, Korea, Mr. Park Jin, uh, to have initiated this conference and to have brought in uh, people that are familiar with all the potential dangers and ramifications uh, of these aspects and the urgent need to define rules to deal with it. Exactly, and Foreign Minister Park Jin, of course, has really emphasised the role of this uh, forum as well in um, addressing these new emerging security threats that you mentioned, uh, particularly cyber security, of course, um, cyber threats that South Korea and Israel both face. And both countries are also uh, geographically compromised. They have limited natural resources and they face security threats from their closest neighbours, of course. And they also rely on the United States for security. So amid all of this, amid these unfavorable conditions, how can countries like South Korea and Israel really cooperate to increase their capability in deterring both conventional threats and new security threats? I always say it years ago, when I first came here as a Minister of Industry and Trade and I was in charge of the Israeli chief scientist, uh, I said, uh, and I proposed to uh, Korean business people and to the Korean government uh, um, representatives that I think uh, Israel and Korea together can do a lot. Uh, I, I consider Korea to be one of the most sophisticated and successful uh, industrial and economic countries in the world. Uh, you are doing uh, unbelievable things uh, and which uh, turned you into one of the most powerful uh, economies in the world. I think that Israel is uh, quite successful. Uh, we are not as successful as you are, but we are quite successful in uh, promoting high tech and uh, new uh, innovations and developments in the areas of high tech. And I think that if we will join forces, uh, uh, I think that there is a great uh, chance that uh, we will develop together the necessary means to increase the defensibility that is needed to deal with cyber and uh, also the uh, research and development in other areas which are uh, discussed in this conference now uh, with regard to the spread of pandemics and the uh, possible research to try and uh, uh, defend uh, uh, to, to find the necessary vaccines which can uh, be uh, very helpful in dealing with this. So I think that we have to create uh, 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 a certain uh, cooperation and, and a more a body of, of uh, mutual research and development that will be financed by both sides uh guided by the governments guided by the leaderships of our country to uh, focus on some of these areas and i think that with the um, joint ability of both your scientists and your experts and and uh, your uh, industrial conglomerates and ours uh, there is a lot that can be done and and uh, i hope that it will be done and i hope that this conference perhaps will contribute the creation of some joint bodies that will work together. Of course, uh, South Korea and Israel are both uh, strong investors in R&D, of course, uh, topping the world's uh, rankings, really, when it comes to the share of GDP and uh, research. And, well, they also have a lot of potential for innovation as well. But seeing uh, my last question to you, Prime Minister, seeing as we're, you're here on the Korean Peninsula, how do you think South Korea should really defend itself against the uh, growing nuclear and missile threat from North Korea? Look, we, we face a somewhat similar, not, not identical, but similar uh, issue with uh, Iran, which is uh, trying to build a nuclear power and that uh, we are trying to, uh, to um, stop it. Uh, number one, and there is, it's very important, I think that North Koreans know that uh, South Korea is absolutely, entirely, 100% protected by the United States of America. Therefore, if you ask me, what is the probability that the North Koreans will 
try at any time in the future to uh, use their uh, set of weapons, nuclear and not nuclear, uh, to attack uh, South Korea, I think that this will cause their demise. And they know it better than most. So I'm not that much afraid if something will happen from today to tomorrow. What I'm concerned about with regard to North Korea is the very fact that they invest so much in the uh, um, development of sophisticated weapons is a continuous threat that is hanging over the skies of South Korea and can affect the, uh, the mood, the attitude uh, of your uh, population. And also, that can uh, force you to invest in areas which, under different circumstances, will not be necessary and you could focus on dealing with problems which are serious and, and, and real for the, uh, uh, for the uh, good uh, quality of life of, of your people. In any event, since cyber is definitely one of the measures in which maybe the North Koreans can use, I promise you that if we will cooperate, I mean, we means you, uh, South Korea and the state of Israel in these areas, uh, you will be in a better position to defend yourselves against such attacks coming from uh, your neighbors. Uh, and that definitely will contribute to the uh, security and the well-being and the quality of life of uh, this great country of yours uh, and the people that live here who are peace-loving people. So great potential there for collaboration and innovation between South Korea and Israel in addressing all these diverse security challenges ahead. That was Ehud Olmert, former Prime Minister of Israel. Thank you very much for being in Seoul and for joining us this morning. Thank you very much for hosting me. That wraps up the first half of New Day at Adirang. But do stick around, we have more coming your way in the second half. We'll be back in just a moment. South Korea's experience in tackling COVID-19 and introduced a Korean new a Korean survivor of Japan's wartime sex slavery met with the extraordinary COVID. climate crisis and pledged to work with the EU to tackle the challenge. The objective of its North Korea policy is protests is gathering across the country to peacefully demand an end to hate and violence. Arika, what matters? So good right now Maybe I had a drink or two But then 
And welcome back to the second half of New Day at Arirang. South Korea has reported its first two suspected cases of monkeypox. The Korea Disease Control and Prevention Agency said Wednesday that two probable cases were identified the day before and that diagnostics are being conducted. Officials added that one of the individuals had been admitted to a hospital in Incheon after showing potential symptoms of the virus upon entering the country via Incheon International Airport. The identities are being withheld. The Bank of Korea warns that the nation could face inflation worse than during the 2008 global financial crisis. Prices are heading higher because of geopolitical issues and bad weather, according to our Kim Yonsung, who files this report. South Korea may soon see inflation worse than the one in 2008 during the global financial crisis. The Bank of Korea on Tuesday projected that prices may grow at rates faster than they did in 2008, when prices rose 4.7 percent on year. Already, the rate of inflation seen earlier this year was similar to the one seen 14 years ago. But analysts at the central bank are projecting even greater increases for June, surpassing May's 14-year high figures. And it may stay above 5 percent for the latter half of the year as well. The increases come on the back of global geopolitical and climate-related events, including Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which has driven up oil prices, and dry weather, which has resulted in a hike in grain prices. The supply-side effects are showing up as price and wage increases. Also, with social distancing lifted, inflationary pressure on the demand side has also increased. The lifting of social distancing measures led to more people dining out, which along with higher demand for processed foods, pushed prices up. And with that in mind, the Bank of Korea is also concerned about agflation, when a rise in agricultural commodity prices drive up living costs. In particular, the agflation phenomenon caused by rising international food prices is likely to continue for a long time due to its downward rigid and persisting characteristics. Meanwhile, core inflation, which doesn't count volatile food and energy prices, jumped above 3 percent in April and May. And with the risk of recession in the U.S. looming large, domestic and international markets may become even more erratic than they are now, heightening risks of steep price rises and sluggish economic growth. The Bank of Korea says that it will rely on data and numerous forms of indices to keep monetary policies flexible and adaptable in a risky economic climate. Kim Yeonseung, Arirang News. In a cabinet meeting, President Yoon Seo Gai emphasized that the reform of public institutions must not be delayed any further. New measures would include tightening up government spending. Yoon Jung Min shares us his remarks. This is how President Yoon Song Yeol emphasized the need to address economic difficulties during Tuesday's weekly cabinet meeting, urging all public servants to work with a sense of crisis. And this week's meeting focused on reforming public institutions where the president said there's a need for intensive adjustments to spending. Yoon added that debts owed by public institutions have shot up during the past five years to 583 trillion won, which is about 450 billion U.S. dollars. Noting as an example the sharp interest rate hikes by the U.S. Federal Reserve, the president said countries around the world are doing all they can to tackle economic challenges and once again stressed the need for a private-led economy and the cutting of red tape. On Tuesday, the cabinet agreed to lower quota tariffs to 0 percent on 13 import items where supplies and prices have been unstable, including cooking oil, flour and pork, and to extend the current tax incentives for car buyers.
Bracing for what lies ahead, the top office has already activated an emergency economy response system while it'll look into streamlining public institutions so that more money can be saved and used for people in need. Yoon Jong-min, Arirang News. Now, one of South Korea's core national agenda items is to make Busan the host city for the World Expo 2030. And South Korea's Prime Minister delivered a presentation to the Expo governing body in France to prove South Korea's commitment to hosting the global event. Chae min Jung reports. South Korea has ambitiously pitched its bid to host the World Expo 2030 in the port city of Busan. The country's Prime Minister Han dok su delivered the presentation on Tuesday at the Bureau International de Exposition in France. The agency with 170 member states is in charge of overseeing and regulating World Expos. South Korea's proposed theme for World Expo 2030 Busan is transforming our world, navigating toward a better future. The Prime Minister stressed the importance of building a future in which humans, technology and nature can prosper in harmony. And he said that South Korea would like to play a bridging role between developing and developed nations. In promoting the country as a potential host, Han highlighted the nation's ability to bounce back from economic hardships. Korea has overcome war, poverty, economic crisis, and other difficult challenges to emerge as the world's 10th largest economy. We want to serve with the international community by sharing these valuable lessons in the hope that we can help illuminate the way forward for all. Han also underlined that South Korea has become an active player in the global community through cutting-edge industries and trendy cultural output. South Korea's President Yoon song yeol wrapped up the presentation with a video message. The 2030 Busan World Expo will be a festival where everyone around the world can celebrate, enjoy, and experience the future. See you all in Busan, Korea. South Korea is competing against Italy and Saudi Arabia, and the winning country will be announced in November 2023. The South Korean government says the expo would bring significant economic benefits to the country worth around 47 billion U.S. dollars. Choi min Dong, Arirang News. June 25th marks 72 years since the start of the Korean War. While the memories of the war are fading as time goes on, the reasons why the war must be remembered are as strong as ever. Lee hoo with this report. The Forgotten War. That's how the Korean War is often referred to outside of Korea. It's because the war, which took place between 1950 and 1953, is at times overshadowed by the Second World War before it and the Vietnam War after. And the impression of the Korean War is fading even in South Korea. According to a survey taken in 2020 by the Jungang Ilbo newspaper, only one out of seven South Korean teens knew the year that the Korean War started. Compared to those in older age groups, the figure was significantly lower. Students say this could be because the war feels too distant for them. It doesn't seem that there is much interest in the topic. From a student's perspective, it seems like something unrelated to us, something only in the books. Yet there are those who are working hard to make sure the war is not forgotten. Among them is Park Ok Sun, who served during the Korean War as a nursing officer. As the current director of the Korean War Veterans Association's Jongnogu District branch, she regularly helps educate the next generation about the Korean War. How difficult was it to restore all the things destroyed during the Korean War? So we shall not start wars, we shall not fight, but instead conduct balanced security education to bring peace to all countries. Meanwhile, experts say that we should pay attention to how we remember the war. There are tendencies to remember this war differently based on each country's situation rather than how it should be remembered, a shared tragedy that should never happen again. Therefore, how we remember the war will play a very important role in our pursuit of peace. He added that more experience-based education could help. For example, visits to memorial sites would do more than in-class lectures in preserving the memories of war.
as time goes on and the Korean War moves further into the past, we need to keep making efforts to ensure the war is not forgotten but remembered. Lee si Arirang News. Let's take a look at what's going on in the world now. There's chaos on Britain's railways as nearly 40,000 workers have left their posts in the UK's biggest rail strike in 30 years. Only 20% of rail services in England, Scotland and Wales were operating on Tuesday. This comes after talks on Monday failed to reach an agreement on a wage increase, with the Transport Union rejecting a 2% increase against their request for 7%. Further strikes on Thursday and Saturday could also lead to major disruptions for millions of workers. Meanwhile, only 60% of trains are expected to run on Wednesday due to a delay in services as some operating staff are not doing overnight shifts. Prime Minister Boris Johnson has said that the strike could harm businesses that are still recovering from the impact of COVID-19. Food manufacturing company Kellogg's is set to spin off into three independent companies in a move that will separate its iconic brands into distinct snacking, cereal and plant-based businesses. The announcement was made on Tuesday and signals Kellogg's move to focus on snacks as trends show people increasingly eat between meals. This comes as sales figures for cereals reached only 2.4 billion US dollars and have stagnated in the US due to a wider range of breakfast options. In contrast, the company's snack sales reached $11 billion. Names for the new companies are set to be announced later, with the process scheduled for completion by the end of 2023. Electric car company Tesla is moving forward with plans to lay off up to 10% of its salaried workers. Tesla CEO Elon Musk provided details of the move at the Qatar Economic Forum on Tuesday, where he said the staff will be laid off over the next three months in order to grow the company's hourly workforce. According to Musk, the cuts make up about 3 to 3.5% of the total workforce. He added that in a year from now, the company's workforce will be bigger than today's figures. This year, Tesla has opened up two new factories in Germany and Texas. Turning back to the UK, where around 6,000 people, including groups of druids and pagans, assembled at Stonehenge to celebrate the summer solstice by watching the sun rise. The event on Tuesday morning marks the longest day of the year in the Northern Hemisphere. The 4,500-year-old World Heritage Site has been home to solstice celebrations for millennia, as it was designed to line up with the midsummer sunrise and midwinter sunset. This year was the first in-person event since the COVID-19 pandemic started over two years ago. Thousands more watched the event online. The editor of one of Russia's last independent newspapers has auctioned off his 2021 Nobel Peace Prize for a record 103.5 million US dollars. Taking place in New York, the Monday auction broke the previous record price paid for a Nobel Prize medal, which was $4.76 million back in 2014. Proceeds from Monday's sale are going to UNICEF to benefit children displaced by the Ukraine war. Dmitry Muratov was awarded the Nobel Prize in October 2021 and was one of the founding members of the Novoya Gazeta newspaper. The paper was forced to stop its activities in Russia in March as the Kremlin clamped down on journalists and public dissent following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Matthew Ashley, Adirang News. Good morning. Well, it felt like midsummer on Tuesday and heat did linger through the evening. And I really can't imagine how people in the regions under heat alerts were able to bear the heat yesterday. 
While the capital regions will notice temperatures dropping down a couple of degrees, but elsewhere will be as hot as Tuesday. And the air stays soupy, with a chance of passing rain in southern inland regions and mountainous regions in Kangwondo province. Monsoon rain returns on Jeju Island tonight before spreading nationwide on Thursday. Well, morning lows are hovering around 22 degrees Celsius in most parts, which are similar to the same time yesterday. Now, parts of Daejeon so high spiking above 35 degrees yesterday, but it will be less hot at 33 degrees, but relief is on the way. Expect a monsoon to hit nationwide from tomorrow with heavy rain in the forecast from tomorrow afternoon into Friday at dawn. With that, here's a look at the weather conditions around the globe. And that wraps up our news course for this hour, but we'll be back tomorrow for our Thursday's edition of New Day Arirang. Thanks as always for tuning in, but stick around for more updates throughout the day. Have a great rest of your day wherever you are, and as always, take care.